All right. So um, thank you everybody again for joining us for another great Money Monday. Um, in usual due form, we have an amazing guest with us today to spread some great information for us. Really, our main goal is one, to be in a situation where you can make good decisions on your own, but always to be in a situation where you can evaluate um, the professionals that you're with as well to make sure that those are great professionals for you to work with also. And I know there are a number of ladies that are in the group and they are business owners and really looking and trying to grow their business, establish their business, legitimize their business and what have you. And so one of the main impediments to um, really being a successful business owner, a lot of times could just simply be your tax planning. And the last thing you wanna do is have a fight with the IRS. Um, and so we have a great professional with us today. I'll read a little bit about Ms. Kay Renee a former auditor and collector for the Internal Revenue Service, so not someone who was priorly our friend, um, but it's good to have a friend on the other side now. She worked there for nine years, six months. She's passionate about helping people achieve financial freedom and handling their tax issues. She says, I ain't never scared of the IRS but I am. Um, <laughs> and she uses what she's poured in, what they poured into her to help people sleep peacefully at night, resolve tax problems and so forth. As the owner of Purpose and Passion Tax Company, she quit the IRS on a Friday in September of 2017 to open her company the very next day. Taxpayers that she audited encouraged her to start her own business and she's glad that she listened. Her purpose in life is to help people. She's also our foster mom to three beautiful children and has been and has a 13 year old son as well. Kay is a regular person who decided to be the change that she really wanted to see. And I think this is so much reflective of us, especially as black women, really working hard, grinding away at a job and understanding the ins and outs and really wanting to be that value to someone else. And so I really want to thank Kay for joining us today, and I'll turn it on over to you. Yay! Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and dive right into it, because this is business, right? So one of the questions is, um, as I'm a former auditor, as it's already been stated, um, and one of the questions I was asked is, why do people fail business audits? The main reason people fail business audits um, is they're not keeping adequate records. They're not keeping their receipts. They are just writing expenses down. Um, the IRS, the tax code says that we must keep our receipts. So in order to be able to write off a business expense, you must keep your receipt um, because it shows your, end of, your itemized expense. So let's say we go to Costco. I've audited people who went to Costco and, you know, when you look at their um, expenses and they say that, you know, well, I spent $2,000 at Costco and I look at their bank statement and I say, that is true. You did spend $2,000 at Costco on November 2nd, um, 2018. Now may I see the actual receipt for that? When they show me the receipt, the receipt shows me that they bought a pool. Get it? Therefore, that is not allowable. That is why the IRS does not go by bank statements and credit card statements. Um, and again, that's the tax law. Um, you need to provide your itemized receipt. So your receipt shows the actual expense. So let's say you went to Costco again, it's that same $2,000 um, expense. Well, I see that you actually only spent $30 on paper pens and paper clips. So we're going to go ahead and give you the, well, the IRS, I say we, I no longer work there, but the IRS is then going to go overhead and give you the expenses for the $30 worth of business supplies, office supplies that you purchased, but they're not going to write off your family's pool. You get it, friends? So another thing, so you should keep your receipts for um, as long as you have that return. So the, let's go back. So let me take a step back. So when it comes to being audited, the IRS actually, um, let me, okay, so this is this is a client's folder that I have right now. You kind of can't see it. So it's like, it's small, it's thin. That's how every audit honestly starts off. But an audit could end up looking like this. Can you see it? Do the 
my virtual background. You can't, huh? Let me just go ahead. Well, I don't want to take it off, but basically it can end up super duper thick. <laughs> and that's because of all the things that we learned during the audit. So um, the way that it works is this. So let's say it's 2020 right now. So the IRS right now is auditing people for 2019, 2018, and 2017. Um, depending on when they file. So let's just say I still work for the IRS and it's tax year 2019. Um, I'm automatically going to receive your 2018 um, income tax return to audit. I'm going to review that return and then I'm also going to look for the same expenses. So it's called a PCA. Um, it's a, a no. Okay, I forgot the name. Y'all, I haven't worked there in so long. <laughs> but basically, like you receive the sheet of paper, and it tells you like three issues that you need to look for. That the IRS, someone else has already pre-selected these issues to be audited. So it could be contract expenses, it could be um, charitable contributions, and let's say filing status. So I look at your at those three issues. I look and see that you've claimed $30,000 worth of expenses for those three issues. My job as an auditor is to look at your 2017 income tax return and your 2019 income tax return. So if you ended up claiming those same expenses on those returns, then I'm going to audit you for those two years as well. That's how really all audits start off as one year unless it's like egregious. And then sometimes we'll receive the PCA and it'll already tell us automatically that we're gonna audit you for the two years. But so when it comes to that, I promise you I'm answering your question. So when it comes to um, how many years should you keep it, the IRS can go back up to six years, depending on how egregious the topic is and the results of that audit is, it can go back more. But traditionally, the IRS only goes back three years. To be honest, when you ask, like, how long should you keep your receipts, you really should be keeping your receipts with your income tax return. So it's not like you're going to go off searching for them because you use those receipts to complete your income tax return or your tax professional. Um, use that information, your summary, your profit and loss statements to prepare your income tax return. So all of that information should really be held together. And I tell my clients to keep everything for 10 years. If you have, um, like if you are a landlord um, and you have tenants, you need to keep those expenses, um, your receipts for however long you have that as a rental property because you can be audited any of those years. And sometimes you have carryover losses. Um, let's say your modified adjusted gross income exceeds the 150, 150,000. So you can't even take the losses on your rental property. You have to carry those forward. So if you have to carry those forward and then you're audited on your last year that you have the property as a um, rental property and you now sell it and they want to see where, where did you get this credit from? You need to be able to produce the very first income where that credit started. Does it make sense? Oh, wow. That's a lot. It's a lot. I would say it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's a great point. You know, it's always great to have documentation and so forth. But when I think about it, you know, I can have a Costco receipt that's six months old and I can barely read it. I, you know, so I, yes. So that's another issue. So um, I gave a presentation to tax professionals and I'm like telling them, like, look, for your clients, make copies of it. Like, honestly, because receipts fade. Like, and it's, it sucks as an auditor when someone is giving me this receipt and they're like, Miss West, I promise you, it really was on here. Um, and I'm like, I know it was, but oh, it's not on there right now during this audit and it sucks. So if you just make a copy on a regular black and white or even get one of those machines where they say you can just scan your receipts and file it automatically, like that's good because your receipts do honestly fade. That's good stuff. B has a good question. She says, is it true if you're a small startup and you don't make $10,000 in revenue that you don't have to file taxes that year? <laughs> Where you learn that at on Facebook? What's to be true, B? <laughs> you learn that on Facebook? <laughs> so just to, just to go, so I hope my face answered that question. Um, but let me just go ahead and give you like the history, um, just in general. So anytime a person receives more than 
they're required to file an income tax return. So there's no way that you're going to be allowed to earn $10,000 and not file an income tax return and you're self-employed. However, let's say you are a wage earner. Um, I do not have the minimum filing requirement. Um, so there is a limit. So if your income falls below like the standard deduction, then you're not going to be required to file. But then it goes back to certain types of income because let's say Let's just say, and this is an example because I honestly don't have it memorized, but let's say the minimum um, income requirement is $10,000. let us say you're, for wages, you received $8,000, but let's say you received a 1099 for $600. Now you're required to file an income tax return because anytime you receive a 1099 for more than $600, you are required to file an income tax return. So that kicked it out of the park. Like you have to file that income tax return. And I really want to say, I think I'm missing it, mixing it up because something in my head is telling me it's really $400. Anytime you receive more than $400 on a 1099, or it's really anytime you receive more than 400, but you're supposed to issue 1099s once you've paid one person $600 so that they can report their income because people don't always, you're on the honor system basically to report the income until you hit the $600 threshold. Now, that's a great question. It's definitely as a business, as you're getting started, regardless of what it might be, um, it could just be repairs to the location that you're at or whatever that might be. And if you're paying a company, I presume that you wouldn't necessarily need the 10, you wouldn't need to issue them a 1099. But if you just have like a handyman that comes and it's the same leak in the same place, what are the consequences for not issuing them a 1099? I mean, you're supposed to, you're, you are like, you know, my gardener, he makes $600 a year. He gets a 1099 at the end of the day. Let's say he wants to go buy a house. And all he does is gardening. He's how are you going to prove his income? Like for real, like, and that's the, that's the thing that bites people in the behind. Like no one wants to report their income, right? Even now let's do this. The PPP loans. The small business loans, everyone didn't want to report their income. Okay, well, now we have this pandemic and people are receiving business loans because they reported business income and that's helping them survive these times. Well, if you've always reported that you never had income and now you want a business loan, what business? That's big. Now, because um, you talk a little bit about like fighting the IRS and so forth. And so unfortunately, I think, and we've had some of this and we've talked about some of this too, you know, on Facebook and so forth, there's a number of different things where people are like, start an LLC and hire your kids and all these kind of things. Um, when you see these things, the first thing I think about is like, you know, what are the consequences and so forth? And so, if you get this advice, you listen to this advice, unfortunately, what do you think like step one when you get audited? Like what are, what are the things to be prepared for? If you got the shoe box full of receipts, that's a good thing. Um, but then like, what, so. <laughs> so what are you gonna do with that shoe box of receipts? Are you gonna bring it to your audit? <laughs> I've, I've had people arrive. There was this guy, I'll never forget. It's this Mexican guy, like, and he was, a. Uh, um, he did, like, he could build you a house, basically. Um, super cool guy. Y'all, he brought me a Forever 21 bag. It was bright yellow. And it was not a small Forever 21 bag. It was a humongous Forever 21 bag. And he sat on my desk. It was this color. Sir, what, 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 do you, what, what's going on? He was like, well, these are my receipts. With all due respect, I know you don't think I'm about to go through your... your Forever 21 bag and organize your receipts. Um, that's not your auditor's job ever. Um, and I definitely made sure, like I asked my manager, like if they come in here with shoe boxes and Forever 21 bags of receipts, do I have to tally it up? She was like, girl, no, that is no, that, that they're not prepared for their audit. So you actually will receive, honestly, if you showed up with a box of receipts um, versus a profit and loss statement and you know, your receipts organized, then you're going to receive an audit report um, 
disallowing those expenses because the auditor is not able to justify those expenses because she can't prove them or he can't prove them. So never show up with a shoebox friends. <laughs> now, or what would be the file or what would be the, you know, let me, I get this request, I get this notification for an audit. What are kind of the pull this, this, and this together? Is it just the three things and the receipts to kind of justify those as you talked about previously? Or how do you, you know, we want to present well, um, of course, if we ever in that situation. So my mind, so the way that my mind works is honestly, like you would already have that together, right? Like if you get a letter saying like, you're going to be audited, it's like, okay, no big deal. Because honestly, the IRS isn't asking you for information that you didn't use to prepare your income tax return. So that information, whatever information they're asking you for, it should be with your income tax return. So you just pull out your folder. So I tell people to organize their records according to the Schedule C. And that should help you, you know, keep you organized. So if the IRS says that they want to look at car and truck expenses, okay, you have your car and truck expenses right there with your income tax return and it's nothing to produce it. Um, a lot of people use QuickBooks. Um, and so sometimes like I will make a copy of their log and then like it'll be numbered or I'll just say the amount. Please show me the expense. So like, and it really is your auditor too, right? So your auditor could be, uh, or your auditor could be like, look, girl, I don't have time for these games, okay, friend? And this is honestly how I start off my audits. Like, sorry, it's a train going by. Like, look, friends, we could be here the four hours as the paper stated, or, you know, we could be done in an hour. It's totally up to you. I have questions I must ask you. But if you realize that there was a mistake made on your income tax return and you don't have the receipts, no judgment, you realize it was a clerical error and you don't have the information and you didn't even realize that number was on your return, just tell me so we don't have to go through it like you got the receipt for it at home. And like they would laugh. And so sometimes people would be like, so yes, I don't have the receipts for this, that, and the other. Okay, so we only got one thing to talk about. So clearly we won't be here for four hours. Um, and so it's really how you, how your auditor approaches you and how you respond to your auditor. Um, some people are not gonna be lax. Some people are power trippy and they're gonna let you know they're the auditor and that they're in charge. And that's unfortunate. They do have a manager that you can speak with um, if that is their approach and their tone. But um, really your auditor does not have to ask you for every single expense. They can do a sample. So if you have if you have your spreadsheet or even like just something in Excel spreadsheet um, or QuickBooks spreadsheet that you created, um, like I would just look at it and be like, okay, can I see the receipt for 7,500? Can I see the receipt for 160,000? And can I receive the receipt for 400,000? If you get that to me, that's called a sample. You may not have any of the other expenses, but since you had those three that I selected, I'm just going to go ahead and not change that issue and give you credit for those expenses in that category. And then we have a question. It says, can bank statements be used if a receipt is not available? No. <laughs> what is it proven? I mean, again, it just proves that you were at a location and that you spent money there. It is not proving the actual item that you purchased. Now what that bank statement can be used for is that you can now contact the store and ask the store to produce you that receipt. Because you have that information, but that's not going to work for your audit. That's good stuff just to be familiar with. Now one thing too, what are some things that people think are deductible and definitely are not? I know people say they're like, oh, you can deduct that. You can deduct that. Go ahead and spend that. You can deduct that. What are some things, especially as you're going through and doing the audit and people have written off, you know, everything under the sun, what are some things that people commonly think are deductible and unfortunately are not? Okay, so I think the easiest way to answer that is, um, according to the tax law, you are allowed to write off expenses which are considered ordinary and necessary for the production of income which means it depends on your industry. So if I'm a race car driver, I probably would spend a lot on mileage and gas. 
if I'm a hairstylist, I shouldn't have that much in car and truck expenses. So it really depends on the business. Um, you can't say like this isn't allowed, that isn't allowed because it really depends on the type of business. Now, are there some corporate structures that get people into more trouble than others? So is it the LLCs, the C-Corps, S-Corps, what have you? So I think the way to answer that question is people get in trouble because they don't know. Like, so for everyone running off to, you know, establish the LLC here in California, um, our LLCs start off at $800, um, which is due within the first four months. But uh, you know, I guess on average, people aren't told that. So you can set up this LLC. You've never made a dollar. You sell baby wipes. You've never made a dollar, but you automatically have to pay $800. So I personally tell people just because a lot of people aren't used to being self-employed because self normally they pay taxes out of their wages. Um, go ahead and just start off as a sole proprietorship, depending on the type of business that you have as you generate income, as it's increasing, then you may want to look to being an S corporation or being a C corporation um, or becoming an LLC. But again, an LLC, like that's really for your state purposes is not really for the IRS. You have to make an election to not be treated um, as a, well, really for LLCs, you're treated as, you have to make the election to be treated as an S corporation. Like it's not automatic. Like you have to ask for that. But even when you become like corp, air quote corporations, like there's an additional tax for that. And so people normally aren't aware of the different structures have different um, financial requirements. Whereas the easiest structure to be is a sole proprietorship. And again, like that's just you paying your regular taxes. You are now responsible for um, a, you now are responsible just for your self-employment taxes. And I do see her question regarding, can I explore a S corporation? I cannot, because it's not that easy to explain, sorry. I can't hear you. <laughs> we did have somebody mention that it's only $50 to incorporate in Colorado. So definitely every state is gonna have their own. Um, definitely key to know what your requirements are, when you have to pay it, Make sure you continuously pay yes. it. <laughs> it's not one size fits um, all. It's not, but the information comes across social media as if it is. And taxes are not a one size fit all. And that's kind of like the problem is that, you know, you heard your girlfriend could do it. So then you did it. And now you're running into issues that she never was running into because it's not a one size fit all. And B2, I know we um, we did have a Money Monday where we talked a little bit about the difference between the LLC and C Corp and S Corp. I'm going to make a little note um, and try and find it and tag you into it later. But it is it comes down kind of the way the organization itself, so your company is taxed and that flow through. Um, so I'm making a note. I'm going to look for that tonight. <laughs> um, and so one other thing, when you're thinking about a professional, so... If you have an audit, you have an issue, do you hire someone to represent you or is it better to just do it yourself? I think that really depends on the person. Um, some people are like terrified of the internal revenue service. So um, I would say for that person, yes, hire a professional because you being frozen is not going to help your situation because the deadlines are still gonna be the deadline, whether you make a move or not. And not making a move is going to cause you harm um, because the IRS will go ahead and enforce collection activity, which could be a federal tax lien or federal levies, which could be your wages or your bank account. Um, so I think it really just depends on the person. Um, if you have your steps together and you know, like, you know what you're doing, and you can represent yourself, then by all means, go for it. But there are some people who they don't know. They're like, look, I don't know. Like my tax person did this and I don't know what they did and I can't find them to explain it. You, you're going to need some help. <laughs> now, can you give us some examples? Um, tell us a little bit about some experiences you've had, um, whether it be horrible mishaps, maybe some unintentional mistakes and so forth that people have made in the past. For my clients or people that I audited? 
Probably, um, I guess people that you've audited and then you can tell us a little bit maybe even about some clients that you have. Okay, girl, I got to go back three years and it's memory. Um, let's see. Well, okay, so I will say that I um, you can be audited for different reasons. I do want to say that. So people feel like it's just like, you know, you're just audited because of you did something. You can be audited because of who prepared your income tax return. You can be audited, which, and that's called a prepare project. Um, your auditor will never, ever tell you that you have been selected because you went to Yankee Doodle Taxes. And we're really investigating Yankee Doodle taxes, but part of the way that we investigate Yankee Doodle taxes is by actually um, auditing the people who use their services. You can be audited um, and you did everything right. Um, it's called an NRP, National, I don't know, it's like National Taxpayer Research Program. Um, national project or something like basically and that type of audit is where the IRS audits every single line of your income tax return no one in the world like just know your auditor is not happy to be auditing you when they have to go through every single line of your return um I'm trying to figure out like what's the worst that I saw well, okay, I can say about my very first audit. <laughs> I'll never forget them. So he, um, like, you know, I went through training and training is like five weeks in another state and it's every single day um, and it's different phases. So the phase one was for five weeks. So um, basically like the guy, he confessed to everything, like his audit issues. Um, and he, he claimed his girlfriend and her children as dependents. And we wanted to, to find out like what was going on and how the, why was he claiming them? Um, and he confessed like straight out the bat. He was like, look, money was tight. It was re it was tax time. I knew that if I put information on my return, I could get a lump sum to handle my problems. So I did. He was like, just tell me what I owe. Like none of it is legit. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like I literally just got out of training and they said this would never happen. <laughs> so um I don't know if I really like saw something crazy, crazy. Um, people were like, you know, defend their their wrongness, you know, to the death of them. Um, I saw that. Um, like I would just play like, you know, like I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and, you know, repeat your story back to you and make it seem like I was confused. So I'd ask more questions. Um, and then when it was all said and done, I repeat back to you what you said. And then like, they would look at me like, oh, she was listening. Oh, she does know. Um, but I don't know if I really had crazy, crazy stories. Now, what are some of the best tips that you can think of to give, um, to help make sure that you don't come up or appear with like some type of red flag? And so you can prevent, hopefully, I mean, you may get a random audit, but hopefully whatever it is that's in your return won't be some of those red flags. That's why I was saying you could be audited no matter what. There's not a really a way around it. Like the fact that you filed an income tax return, you can be audited because there's multiple reasons why people are audited. It could be, um, you may have done nothing, right? But you could be being audited because of earned income credit because there's a national study going on and they want to know of the 1,000 people who claimed earned income credit, how many of them were actually really entitled to it? Or do we need to be more stricter on who we're giving this credit to? Do we need to be asking more questions? I don't think that, um, well, let me say this, you know, people feel like there is a three-year rule um, to, you know, like you can claim a loss for three years. Please get back. Thank you. Um, that's not true. That is not true. <laughs> and I'll say it one more time. That's not true, friends. Um, if your business has a loss, it has a loss. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Um, don't get caught up in the three-year rule because it's really more to it. Um, the IRS does look at hobby losses and are people in business to produce income or are they just in business to write off expenses. And if you're just a business to write off expenses, then that's probably more than likely a hobby. 
And I will say this just made me remember one of my crazy audits. Um, there was a couple, they were both educators. They taught math at a college, um, but they had like these crazy expenses um, on a schedule C. And when like basically I was auditing them for those expenses and they were saying that they had to travel and do research and blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, you teach math. What are you researching and what are you studying? Um, and, you know, they were saying that they were doing a research project on like hunger in other countries. I'm sorry, I don't understand what they have to do with math, but okay. Um, and then like they produced this book, but there was one book and they had been working on this project for three years and they never produced income. And so I had to like tell them with all due respect, it seems like you spend your summer breaks and your winter vacations traveling and you try to just write off your vacations. And even after pointing out like all of the discrepancies with their story, like they fought tooth and nail and um, they didn't close out the case with me because I ended up quitting. But my coworker ended up receiving the case and one day I ran into her and she was like, do you know, like they're, they're saying that, you know, your decision is wrong and they wanna go to tax court because of it. She was like, you're not wrong. I was like, girl, I know that. But they were like, you know, because for them, they didn't want to have to pay back three years worth of vacations <laughs> um, that they were taking. But I was like, you don't get to write off your vacations. It's great that you went to all these countries and that you took pictures and have a photo book <laughs> of your trip, but that's not a business expense because at no point did you, like you had books produced and you didn't sell one. Ma'am, anybody could order a photo book. Now, how long is an acceptable time? I definitely know that there's probably differences depending on the type of business that you have. I mean, if you're researching any drug um, per se, you might have a longer time period where you might report some losses and so forth. Um, but what would be kind of acceptable versus questionable? Well, again, the IRS allows you know, the IRS does allow, you know, the three years, but it's not the way that people think it is. So it's like, you have to prove that you're really pursuing income and that unfortunately you're not earning income. Like you have to be pursuing income, actively trying to generate income for your business. And then it's then like, honestly, common sense kicks in. So you've been chasing this dream for five years. You're 80,000 years old. When are you going to realize you got to try something different? Now, what are the consequences? So like, I mean, this couple, of course, we don't necessarily know all the details about what happened and so forth. From a financial standpoint, you know, you're going on these vacations, you're writing off all the vacations that you've ever been on. What are the financial consequences? So, of course, you know, you're redoing your taxes, you're not taking off this write off and what have you, but what are some of the penalties that people should be aware of? Girl, that's a whole list of penalties. Like for real. Give me one second, I'm gonna pull out the sheet. <laughs> There's a list that people have no idea. I, and, and I think that's huge because oftentimes we're getting this advice and I know for a fact we see advice from some random person that said, you know, start up this company and sell, you know, shakes or what have you. And it doesn't matter if you make any money, just put it in place so you can write things off. Um, I was watching a presentation not too long ago and they talked about um, make sure you form your corporation before the conference so you can come to Hawaii and write off the Hawaii trip. And so, I mean, it's definitely one of those things where you're like, oh, all I got to do is form a company and then get to write off a trip to Hawaii. Like who the heck wouldn't do that? Um, but I definitely know that it's one of those things where you might not be as aware of and you may not be aware of the consequences. And if you're not, um, you may think it's worth the risk versus knowing kind of the consequences that can come from that risk. Yeah, um, I definitely don't advise that. And honestly, that's just because people people think that way because they feel like they can just get over. Honestly, like that's what that boils down to. Um, 
sorry. So I'm, I'm literally going through like my, when I was an auditor, they're called lead sheets. So I'm going through my lead sheets. And remember, okay, let me just show you this stack. Remember how I said like your, your, your file starts off thin, but it becomes thick? This is like an audit. A whole bunch of pages. I want people to be fully aware that there are multiple consequences. So one, okay, so there's a, a civil, so one of these, it's called a work paper. Um, so on one, <clears throat> this is called a civil penalty approval form. So here are some examples <laughs> of penalties that someone can walk away with. Um, fraudulent, failure to file, negligence, substantial understatement, other accuracy related penalties, gross valuation misstatement, Accuracy related penalty on understatements with respect to reportable transactions. So that would be for the young lady who said that there was $10,000. She heard that there was $10,000 she didn't have to report. Um, there's fraud. Then there's the alternative penalty position. There are prepare penalties, understatement due to unreasonable positions, prepare penalties, understatement due to willful or reckless conduct, failure. So these are like prepare penalties. You guys don't really need to know that part. Um, there is the regular failure to file for a delinquent and or non-filed returns. There's the penalty for your estimated tax payment as an individual. And then there's also a penalty for your estimated tax um, taxes as a corporation. Now, are those hard dollar penalties? Are those percentage penalties? They're always percentages. Um, the fraud penalty, I want to say, is like 80%, if I'm not mistaken. It's either 80% or 100% of the tax. Like, it's horrible. And if you are assessed a fraud penalty, which would be what you just said, like, I create this business so I can go on this trip, um, those cases are rolled over to, like, the fraud department. And they come after you, like, tooth and nail. Now, when does it become, um, and I, I know nobody is thinking this, but when does it become something where you're concerned about jail time? Fraud. <laughs> Fraud. Because that means you like, you're in, like, you're going out of your way to, to do something. So like sometimes like taxpayers would, I never experienced this, but you know, I learned about it. Um, when taxpayers like they don't have the receipt but you know they'll tell you like during the audit okay well i have the receipt at home then they go home and they try to create a receipt and then you know it's clear as day when you see it like this is just a mess that you you saw from somewhere else or you copied and now you like brought it to the irs um and then like they start asking questions so if we receive something that we feel is false or that like a taxpayer went out of their way to deceive the IRS, then we contact the fraud unit and ask them, hey, look at these records. What do you think? And then wow. the fraud unit says, hey, we'll take over this case for you. Or they'll say, go back and ask them this, go back and ask them that. So sometimes you can have an auditor who's working with a fraud department and you don't know. <laughs> and all you're doing is digging your hole deeper. And it's like not to pump fear, but it really is a reality of like what happens behind the, the door. Now, um, we do have another question. It says, what's the difference between an LLC and an S Corp as it relates to taxes? The way that it is taxed. So like just the LLC in general, that is the, um, that's your state. But then you're asking the IRS to tax you as a corporation because now you have the LLC, but it does, none of that matters if you are commingling your funds. And, and that's a good point too, when you talk about commingling of funds, what does that look like for people? Um, I don't think most people even think about it because you're swiping the same debit card for both transactions or, you know, your first example, when you talked about going to Costco, you buy a little bit of groceries, and then you buy, you know, some printer paper too for the business. 
<laughs> so That's how do you entangle me? <laughs> <laughs> and so what are some of the best techniques to really show that differentiation between the two? And Leticia, let me know if we answered your question as well. <laughs> so you need a business account. Like that's easy. That's how you stop commingling. Business expenses come out of business business accounts. Business income goes into the business account. If you are going to pay yourself or if you're going to take an owner's draw, then write yourself a check. Do not go to your computer on your smartphone and just transfer the money because really there's no paper trail for that. Um, you need to be very tedious when it comes to your own records. Um, again, because if someone sues you and you are an LLC, they're gonna look, did you keep everything separate? If you're a sole proprietor and you're sued, that automatically includes you. But if you, if you went out of your way to become an LLC and you didn't separate your business expenses from your personal expenses, then it was all in vain. So you can't take the family to the movies on your business card and then you buying, paying for business expenses out of your personal expenses. No, you are co-mingling. That knows and voids everything that you worked hard for. So let's say you're... Um, Let's say you really don't have enough money in your business account to pay for, um, let's say your, your office rent is due and you don't have the $1,000 to pay for that. Write your business a check from your personal account and put on their loan. Then from your business account, pay that business expense. And then when you get the money in that account, and then you could write yourself, right now you write yourself a check from your business account saying, paying loan of $1,000. But you can't just go back and forth from your phone because no one knows what just happened. For all we know, you took matter and then you went and did whatever. We can't tell just a regular transaction from a, you know, your business didn't have the money in it. I think that's one of the things definitely the making sure we're separating expenses as much as possible. Now, one thing too, um, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, some of these like Facebook myths and so forth. Um, can you think of some of the social media myths that people are saying, oh, just do this, just do that, just, you know, this type of thing will save you so much in taxes and so forth. Can you think of some of them that you're seeing a lot of or too many of or maybe it's just always the thing with the LLC, like always the thing with the LLC. It's annoying. Um, so someone says um, if she starts an LLC in one state and she moves, does she need to start the LLC over again in the new state? How would she fill her file her taxes for the LLC in this situation? She needs to look at her state's requirements. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. And, definitely, and you can own an LLC for a state that you don't live in too. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to, you know, if you live in Georgia, you can own an LLC that's in Florida. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you may have to look at what are the requirements to do business. To operate in that business. Yeah. Exactly. So which yeah. is um, a bit different than necessarily where you live. Um, and so I think that's gonna be one of the main differences, not necessarily your LLC has to be where you sit because- yeah, you know, I don't think you have to reestablish it, but by all means, you do need to see what is required for you to do business in that state, in that city, in that county. And Tiffany, you um, asked, what's the thing with the LLCs? Um, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that so we can get you a good answer on that one. Um, but definitely, I mean, most people are talking about corporate structures and so forth, but it's one thing to be incorporated in one place and you don't necessarily have to lose your established business, especially your growing business credit. You have loans and business accounts and all these kind of things and people move. That's the reality of the life that we live in. Um, but you can own a business in a state, but you will still have to be authorized to do business in the yeah, other state. state. Yeah, and that's going to be the one of the bigger things. So as you're doing new business in a new state, um, making sure that you understand how do I do new business? So you were selling widgets in Georgia, and now you want to start selling those widgets in South Carolina. Are you at a point where South Carolina will allow you to sell widgets in South Carolina? You don't have to then do a whole new LLC in South Carolina. Just will they allow you to do business yeah. in this new place?
Perfect. Okay, got it. Any other questions, ladies? Any other things that you can think of? I think one of the main things is there are so many different levels of tax in and of itself. Um, and as we start thinking about things like the establishing of your business and your legitimizing of your business, it's one not only for tax, but it's for asset protection. Um, and so like Kay talked about is if you start pulling out the business credit card and buying drinks at the bar, you know, were you, were you, you know, talking to a client that drinks at the bar? Right, right. Yeah, or, right. Um, now, <laughs> right. And was it a legit, was it a legit business conversation? Because <laughs> if it was, you could rent it from. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's legit. one of the things of having the legitimized business and then <laughs> making sure that you're actually opening a true business checking banking account and establishing that relationship and just understanding that a business is supposed to be its own person um and so just the same way you know think of your business as like your twin sister and so your twin Take sister care of her <laughs> yeah and she can't go around swiping your debit card <laughs> she has a swipe that her would be own an issue card. and so that's one of the big things too of understanding the structure piece and then the records um, that you need to keep. And, you know, I, I definitely have had the shoe box and I, I remember going to my CPA and she was like, girl. Right. <laughs> and so um, I know we've shared, um, we had a speaker not too long ago who had a great discount code um, for if you wanted to use something like a QuickBooks and so forth, but there's a lot of software and so forth. I, I definitely know I'm always like, oh, another receipt, another receipt. But if they can email that receipt to you, <laughs> at least then you can search your email. Um, I mean, for all of our real estate ladies, you can search your email for like Lowe's and all the Lowe's receipts will come right. up. You can say, well, it was in March and you can just start to kind of grind through that. Um, so that's one of the big things too. So it's not just simply setting up the right structure, but separating the expenses, keeping the really good records, and then being responsive. I think one of the biggest problems probably is just people who, you know, you think if I bury my head in the sand, things will go away. And unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> not with the IRS. <laughs> Uh, Letitia, she says, has she ever audited a person that has the common side hustle business like um, paparazzi? So I guess these are like some of these, um, you know, the shakeologies and all of that. So paparazzi, you know, they're selling, what is that, like the $5 earrings and necklaces and so forth. I didn't audit anyone um, that sold paparazzi. Um, I audited someone who sold Mary Kay, though. And I was like, you know, at the end of the day, you really are Mary Kay's biggest customer. <laughs> now, that's that's a good question. I really like that one, too, because oftentimes we will find some of these people who are selling these products and they start to sell the product simply because they want the product itself, maybe at a discount. Um, and it kind of goes back to what you're saying. Maybe they aren't making that much of a profit. Maybe they've never made profit. But how much can they buy of their own supply um, <laughs> and still write it off from one side or the other? Mm, that I don't I don't think that's legit just in general. Um, because technically speaking, like with Mary Kay, like you buy it, right? So Mary Kay sells it, and I, this is just my guess. Um but like I understood it from my friends who have sold Mary Kay, like they buy their product and from the lady, she bought the product for like, let's say $12, but then she sells it to the client for 18. Well, if you keep in a product for 12, then okay, then you're just keeping that bottle for 12. Like <clears throat> you're not really paying for it. Like Mary Kay is really making their money off of you. And then you're hoping that you can sell this product to somebody else for a little bit more to make the money back that you initially invested. So in that case, you know, you're buying, you have five of these bottles of $12, what have you, and you use three of them, maybe you sell two, but you sell those two at, you know, a little party at your friend's house. So now you want to write off the, the wine. You wouldn't be practice. writing off the five. <laughs> you write off the two that you sold. <laughs> that was a personal expense. And that's the thing too, like people don't understand, like, you know, the separation of 
was it really a business expense or was it personal? And I think that's, um, we had a good question. It talks about, wouldn't it be inventory? And this might be a really good one, especially for some of those where they're their own, um, where they're their own. If they're purchasing it, is it their inventory, especially if they're using it on their own? So if she bought the $12 and yeah, it was $12 is inventory. But then when she said, this is the best, you know, what is that, that skin so soft or whatever. Um, she's like, take it out of inventory and put it in my cabinet. Is that still considered inventory? I mean, it. so it is inventory. But again, if you use your own products, then that became personal. That wasn't for business use. That was you. Now, if you used a real bottle and you sampled it on your clients, then okay, yes, that is truly inventory. But if you're really the one that's using it, that's not inventory, ma'am. You bought your, you bought your product. <laughs> like that's the truth. Now, are you seeing any issues or trends? Um, there's definitely an influx of whether it be the paparazzi's, whether it be, um, I mean, we, I don't want to necessarily name all the different ones, but all of kind of the multi-level marketing and so forth. Are we seeing some trends in terms of mistakes that they're making? or um, records that they're not keeping or whether it be things like um, co-mingling or what have you? So I can only tell you like for my actual clients, I don't have clients that do those type of businesses. <laughs> I don't. And I only audited the one Mary Kay lady. And perhaps they're not seeking <laughs> professional tax advisors, which <laughs> very well could be the case. That could be another um, issue. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Um, maybe we'll, maybe there are some tax professional out there that specializes in multi-level marketing businesses. And um, I have to do some searching and see if I can find that professional so we can get some more information. I can't um, yeah. so I know, I can't tell you it's frowned upon. Hustles. <laughs> Look, I can tell you it is frowned upon. <laughs> now, I am familiar more so like with the gig industry um and so you know uber passed here in california i'm sorry i'm trying to turn on my light for my phone um uber passed here in california so like you know uber is legit um so people are excited about that but i never really had like the the multi-level marketing people now, when you think about the gig economy and so forth, um, because those are, and that was part of the new legislation and so forth, those are the independent contractors and such, are there issues that you're seeing that are consistent because they're so easy to get into? So opposed to your gardener who may specialize and do this and really understand the business piece, I mean, really you can go on your phone with a few clicks and all of a sudden you're an Uber driver, um, are there some things that people should be aware of? Are there some mistakes that we're seeing more of? Um, are there some red flags that people are doing? Any of those items you can think of? To be honest, Uber is excellent. Uber was the easiest returns to audit um, because Uber actually keeps, it tells you the mileage. Like it's, Uber is amazing. When they actually issue their clients their 1099s, um, and when they provide the printouts or whatever, when clients actually go to their profile for Uber or whatever, it tells you the mileage. The only thing that Uber does not track is like the mileage of you going from your house to the actual person. You have to keep a track of that. But other than that, Uber keeps track of everything else. So someone says Uber and um, Lyfts and 1099s or K1s. Um, so that's basically kind of what you were saying, just the the records and definitely I know probably not everyone is ones, they're 1099s. So they're 1099s. Um, and so I think that's one of the things too, because not everyone is going to be the same. So there's Uber, there's Lyft, what is there? That via and so or forth. Or even like Instacart, um, like all of the all of the like just the gig economy itself. Um, those independent contractors are issued 1099s. And so that's the thing of understanding what your company is supposed to issue to you. So they're doing that tracking. So there's just some that are better than others. I'm sure there are some other startups, but I would hope that they're <laughs> aware of the software requirements and so forth. So they can provide really good information on an ongoing basis too. 
Um, but yeah, so for any of the ladies out there that are doing some Ubering on the side or maybe as their main, um, it's good to know that they're giving you some good records and so forth that you can have some good tax returns and some quality tax returns as well. <laughs> yes. Now let me say this. Now that first trip that you take for the day when you are driving, so um, for Uber, let's say um, that's your only source of income. Let's say it that way. Um, let's say you go from your house and you go pick up the, the client from Safeway. That first trip, that's on you. Every other trip in between, that is, you write that off. You get to write that off. But that first trip, that's on you. That's on the house. Because you had to get there. But let's say you went from your day job and then you went to drive for Uber. You do get to write that off. Because you've already made your initial trip from home. You get it? Small little details that can make a big difference, especially if you're doing it every day after work and what have you. Hopefully when the world opens back up and more people are out and about and needing rides and stuff. So I definitely see how that can be a big thing. Um, any other, I know we're right at the hour mark. Any other questions, ladies, any other thoughts, um, issues that you wanna bring up? I definitely um, have a couple of notes. I have a one um, item I'm gonna tag in B for a little bit later, but any other items, be sure to drop that in. We'll go ahead and get Kay to answer those questions. And as we're waiting on some of those closing questions, Kay, can you give us any closing remarks? Okay, so I did wanna just finish to answer the questions that you, um, you provided in your original um, post. So, I want to give you guys just general information on some of the normal and ordinary expenses that the average business may incur. So mileage, you can write off mileage, advertising, educational expenses. If you hire an independent contractor, a home office um, or an actual office space, legal expenses, you can hire your tax professional. If you go to a tax professional and you discuss your business taxes, your business structure for a consultation, you can write those things off. Your telephone, um, your cell phone, your internet, any supplies that you need, rental expenses and travel expenses. You can write those type of things off. Um, another question um, was, what is the collection process? The collection process starts with you filing your income tax return. If you do not pay the IRS, will send you a, a tax bill. If you ignore it, the IRS will send you one more notice. If you ignore the second notice, then the IRS begins the collection process. All notices from the IRS say full pay or call. Repeat that with me like a choir, full pay or call. There's no shade of gray. If you do not full pay or call, the IRS will begin to go ahead and enforce collection, collection actions, which could be the levy or the liens. Um, estimated tax payments are due April 15th, <clears throat> excuse me, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th of the following year for the fourth quarter of the year for self-employed individuals. That's big stuff. Everybody gotta remember those 15th of the quarter. <laughs> 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 and of all the people you can ignore, you can ignore your mama, but don't ignore the IRS. Um, so definitely Kay can assist you if you have questions. If you have received that notice that says pay in full or call, maybe before you call. <laughs> Um, or maybe before you start answering and so forth, um, I'll drop Kay's information in here as well so you can reach out to her if you have some specific questions because of the many things or the many hurdles that we're going to fight as we build successful businesses, as we create and grow our wealth, and as we create a situation where we can continuously drive what we're doing to be something great to pass on to the next generation. The last thing that we want is for the IRS to take a chunk of that, just simply due to poor planning, poor records. Lack of knowledge. So, yeah. Just and due so to lack of knowledge. Have, exactly. And that's really what we're here for, to share as much of that information, to make sure that you have good resources, to make sure that you're not relying on simply your neighbor or a coworker. <laughs> <laughs> or some random Facebook share that has no bearing 
on um, the true realities of life. So definitely if you see a Facebook post, don't necessarily just go, you know, sharing that and going into your state um, <laughs> to start up this LLC and hiring your kids or what have you. Um, so definitely make sure that you're reaching out. These videos are always left in the group as well. So there are they are available for you to come back and reference, for you to share with your friends as well. So if you have any additional questions, I'm going to leave Kay's information on the Facebook chat. But then, of course, give us feedback. Let us know what you think. Let us know what additional information that you'd like. And we are so appreciative that you joined us here tonight. Thank you so much, Kate, for being with us. Have a good You're night. You're welcome. Thank you. Goodbye.